We were talking this morning in our Sunday school class with the uh, middle schoolers about prayer. And it was, uh, it was part of Luke chapter 11, 1 through, I think it was 15. And then that this is uh, where Jesus' disciples said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And one of the things we asked the question is, it says, when we went through the Lord's Prayer, he's like, what was the most telling thing about, about that section? And the kids different, said different things, but the thing that came to mind for me was this. He told his disciples to pray like this, Father, who art in heaven. He didn't say God Almighty. He didn't say God Jehovah. He said, call him Father. And I don't know, well, when I go to my father, my, my earthly father, sometimes I just lay my soul out to him and just tell him how I feel. I tell him how, how much problems I have sometimes, but I also tell him how much I need him. I need my heavenly father much more. I need him in the good times just as much as the bad times. Sometimes that's easy to forget but this is an old song back from the 30s and I, I I don't know when I this has just been laid on my heart all all morning throughout the day um, it's a tough one but you, you guys will know it Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak and worn, through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my light is almost gone hear my cry hear my call hold my hand lest i fall take my hand precious lord lead me home when the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet and hold my hand. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired and I am weak and worn through the storm through the night lead me on to the light take my hand precious Lord lead me home for I need you Oh, I need you every hour. I need you. Oh, bless me now, my 
my Savior, I come to Thee. Well, thank you, brother. If you have your Bible, uh, open it up to Habakkuk. If you don't have your Bible, what did you think would happen in church tonight? <laughs> you guys are too serious. I was only kidding. I was just kidding a little bit. But I do think you ought to bring your Bible to church. It's just the way it is. I, I want us to look tonight at this um, little book in the Old Testament, uh, Minor Prophet. And it's possible probably to go through your entire church life and never have a sermon preached from Habakkuk. Uh, or maybe sit in a Sunday school class where Habakkuk is taught or a Bible study. So you might not know where it is. And I can't tell you in your Bible where that may be. But I can help you a little bit. If you open it up toward the middle and just flip around, you'll find it. <laughs> you guys don't care about my help either. I'm, try I I'm trying up here. And uh, there is no shame in using the table of contents, I do that often, but I, I've been spending some time, actually started in Habakkuk a little bit before all this uh, mess that we're living in began, and I didn't realize how, I hate the word relevant because we use that in the church world, and I don't know when God and his ways were ever not relevant, but um, it, I didn't understand how relevant this little book was for what we are living through now. And so what I want to do tonight is I, I want to go through uh, the book pretty quickly and get in on the main theme. We'll probably come back to it in the next day or so, maybe once, maybe twice, whatever the Lord will say. But I think that there's a word that the Lord would have to speak to us tonight. Now it's important to realize when you come to Habakkuk that he is unique. Unique in many different ways. Um, so unique, in fact, that we don't really know a whole lot about him. So little about him that we don't even know how to say his name. Now, I'm saying Habakkuk. Some of you may say Habakkuk, or, or you might say it some other way. And I'm going to help you out here. However you choose to say this guy's name, say it proudly. Because no one can prove you wrong. No, I, I, I'm being serious about that. We, we don't know how his name is really said. Because we don't know his ancestry, we don't know where his name comes from. There are a couple of different opinions on that. There are those that would believe that it's an Akkadian name or an Akkadian loan word. And, and, and Tim Keller would be one of those men. And if it is Akkadian, then this name Habakkuk would simply mean something like plant or fruitful. There is another school of thought that would say that it's a Hebrew name, and if it is Hebrew, then it would mean to embrace, or in, in light of what we're going to get into in Habakkuk's circumstance, it's to embrace God's will in, in spite of your trouble, in spite of your difficulty. We just don't know a lot about this guy. What we do know as we get into this book is that he's struggling. I believe this is the one of the most raw, one of the most real passages of Scripture we have. Because we watch him as he is struggling through his issue. And through that struggle, ultimately, we come to the solution that he finds. He's not only unique in those ways, but he's unique in his role as a prophet. Now, you know that typically the prophet's job is to serve as a mouthpiece of God... He would stand before Judah, stand before God's people, and thunder, thus saith the Lord. And typically, the message would be something like this. You need to straighten up and fly right. You know you're not doing what you ought to do. You're not living the way you know you're supposed to live. You need to straighten up. That's typically the role that the prophet would serve. But Habakkuk doesn't go to Judah on behalf of God. Instead, it's almost reversed. He goes to God on behalf of Judah. It's almost as though when we begin this little book, and some of you may not like this, but it's what we see. It's as though he's pointing his bony finger in God's face, and he says, God, you need to straighten up and fly right. You're not living up to your end of the bargain. You're not doing what you said you would do. It's so strong, in fact, how many of you all would recognize the name H. Ray Dunning? 
He's a professor at Treveca. I figured since I'm in Treveca country, you might know him. Personally, I'm an Olivetian. I wanted to be the best that I could be. You guys don't care about anything. But H. Ray Dunning would say, he's a scholar in the Church of the Nazarene, he'd say that Habakkuk is the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament. Now, I'm not so sure I would go that far, but I would say that he's one of the few men or women that we encounter in God's Word that's bold enough to wrestle or argue with God. Or you could say he's brave enough to wrestle with God. Because what we have when we get into this book, he's just honest. He's real before God. And in case you don't like that idea of wrestling or arguing, let me change it just a little bit. It might help you. He is one of those few individuals that we can say faithfully wrestles with God. See, there's something different about faithfully wrestling. Yes, he's extremely honest. Yes, his frustration shows through. There is no question that he is at a point in his life that's critical. But throughout the entire thing, throughout his argument, he never once hints at the possibility of throwing in the towel. This is what's so incredible. I mean, you never get the idea... That he's willing to turn and walk away. In fact, his heart shows through. It's almost as though we can hear him as he's saying, God, I wouldn't be upset if I could just walk away. I wouldn't be upset if I didn't know that you were holy. In fact, if I can't figure life out with you, how could I ever figure it out alone? And I mentioned this morning that I'm 48 years old and I've been very blessed to grow up in a Christian home. My papa pastored Wofford Missionary Baptist Church in Wofford, Kentucky. I, I come from a long line of preachers. And I've heard my whole life people say things, you, you know, things become cliche. And I can't stand cliche because I think too many of us live in the cliche rather than the reality of who he is. But I've heard my whole life, I don't know how people make it without Jesus. When you watch the things they go through, the struggles of living, and, and, and just think about everything that's happened even in the last five months or so. I truly have come to the place, because I think I mentioned this morning, I'm a preacher so I'll repeat myself. Life isn't easy. It's not even always fun. And I don't know how people make it through the mess of living without Jesus. And that's what we get in an Old Testament context. God, if I can't figure out life with you, then how could I ever figure it out without? So what we have, a conversation occurs. That's what we see all throughout these three chapters. And there's no question that Habakkuk is frustrated. So in his frustration, what does he do? Uh, Well, let me ask you, how many of you all ever get frustrated? Some of you are too holy for that, huh? You're not fooling anybody. I can see on your face that I'm frustrating you tonight. Uh, You you know, he does probably what we do in our frustration. He complains. And we learn in that complaint why he's frustrated. Do you understand what the source of the frustration is? It's because of what he sees. It's a classic problem. It doesn't begin with Habakkuk. There were others before him, and it hasn't ended with Habakkuk. He's looking around at the world in which he's living, and he sees everything that's going on, and he believes God at his word. And yet, what he sees happening in his world doesn't reconcile what he knows of God. And so because of that, he begins to ask questions. He begins to say things like this, why do righteous people suffer? He, he, you could even say, he goes so far as saying, why do wicked people prosper and seemingly march on unrestrained? And why, God, would you allow all of this to happen? It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. What are you doing? See, it didn't begin with him. I, I mean, I'm reminded of a guy named Asaph in Psalm 73. He was the chief musician. He, he's the author of that psalm, and he has the same problem. He was called to be a worshiper, but he got his eyes off the object of his worship and began to watch people. And because of that, 
I mean, check out Psalm 73. It's powerful language. He says, my kidneys were ripped apart. That's the seat of the emotions. Was ripped apart as if a rabid beast with razor sharp teeth was doing it. It almost was his end. Until, he says, I came back to the sanctuary of God. And he's not talking about beautiful buildings like this. And I, I, I want to say, you have a beautiful church. I, I've been in a lot of different churches over the years, and I still call me old-fashioned. I love churches that feel like churches. But this is not what he's referring to. It's a heart position. When he got his focus back on God, things began to change. And here's where we find Habakkuk. So a conversation begins, and I want to fly really quickly through it so you can see what's going on. In chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, we have the first complaint that Habakkuk issues to God. And I'm just going to summarize it for you. In fact, I'll probably use more words than he did. But he comes before God and he says to him, he confronts him. He says, God, why have you put me in a position where all I can see is evil? I look around at the injustice that's going on. I see the evil that your people is involved in, the, the sorrow that it brings, the grief that overwhelms. And God, there's no way around this. These are simply evil times. And I have been praying to you. I have been faithful. Why aren't you listening to me? Have you abandoned us? Are you absent in our time, our need? Don't you care, God, about your people in these evil times? That's the complaint. That's heavy, isn't it? That's the complaint that he goes to God with in verses 2 through 4. And then when you come to verse 5, really verses 5 through 11, you get God's response to Habakkuk. Can we just say this? Aren't you thankful that we have a God who's willing to listen to us in our frustration? Aren't you glad that he can take it? I mean, I do meet people who feel like they can't share their problems, they can't share their complaints with God, and I just think that's kind of foolish, if I can just be so plain, because you do realize, you think it in here, he already knows. I mean, you act like you're going to hide it from him, but he is the knower of man's hearts. He knows what you're dealing with. And the most therapeutic thing, the most holy thing maybe somebody in here tonight can do is to just come and pour it out at his feet. I guarantee you, if nothing else, he will lift your spirit from that place. But anyhow, God not only hears, but he responds. See, if you're going to faithfully wrestle with him, you have to be prepared for what he's going to say. And by the way, I know that he will speak to you. How do I know? Because God has spoken. You remember the Hebrew pastor said this, in times past, during the first stage of Revelation, God spoke bit by bit, piece by piece, through a group of men and women known as the prophets. But in these last days, those are the days in which we're living, God has spoken to us, by son. What does John say? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. So what we see in Jesus is the living word that the written word reveals. So if you want to hear from him, you better be in the word of God. Don't say that he's not speaking to you if you're not willing. There is no new word. I get nervous. I go to places from time to time, and they're super spiritual, and they'll say something like, you got a new word from the Lord? No, I don't, because the word that he spoke is perfect. The word that he spoke is complete. He has given us the final word. Now, he is coming again, but there is no new word. That would mean the word was inadequate, and I want you to know, honey, that he is completely adequate tonight. But we see that God begins to respond in verses 5 through 11. And this is what he says. Oh, Habakkuk. Okay, he doesn't say it like that, but wouldn't you like to hear God say that? Oh, come on, Habakkuk. I am moving. In fact, Habakkuk, if I were to tell you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. Listen to verse 5 of chapter 1. God says, look among the nations and watch. 
Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. So we see God says, I'm not absent. I'm doing something, and I won't get caught up in this so much tonight. But then he goes on to tell him what he is doing. He says, I'm raising up a people. Now, some of your translations will say it differently. They'll say the Chaldeans. Some will say the Babylonians. It's the same people group. And you'll remember from your school days that there was a Babylonian empire. That's because they were a fierce people. And in this hour, they were sweeping across the countryside, devouring every kingdom that they came in contact with, taking possessions that were not theirs. I mean, that's what they're doing. And God's saying, I'm, I'm raising up this incredibly violent nation to judge my people. Now think about that. He says salvation is coming. The salvation that I promised. The salvation that you expect. But here's the thing, Habakkuk. Salvation is going to come through suffering. It won't be easy. But my word will be fulfilled. God says, I'm doing something. In fact, if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. So God is faithful to respond in verses 5 through 11, so in verses 12 through 21, Habakkuk is going to complain some more. And I think this is funny, and you won't think it's funny because you don't think anything else I say is funny. <laughs> but but I, I, I think it's funny because here God has said, um, I'm doing something, and if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. And you know what Habakkuk says? He says, I don't believe it. He says, why, God, would you use, see, I told you you wouldn't think it was funny, but anyhow, why would you use an incredibly violent nation like Babylon, an ungodly people, to bring judgment to your own? Why would you do something like that? I don't understand. And then God responds again in chapter 2, verses 2 through 5, and this is where we find the theme of the book. In the midst of Habakkuk's frustration... In the midst of everything that's going on, God speaks to Habakkuk in verse 4, the second part, verse 4b. This is what he says. He says, but the just shall live by his faith. In the midst of everything that's going on, and now even the confusion from what God has spoken, God says, Habakkuk, the just, the righteous, my people, the just, shall live by his faith. And this is what's so powerful about this. Uh, I preface the entire sermon by saying that you could go through your church life and never have a, a, a sermon from Habakkuk or a Bible study from Habakkuk. But you know this verse. There's no question about it. If you've been in church any period of time, you've heard it before. How do I know? Because it's repeated three times in our New Testament. And any time you come across repetition in the Word of God, you know this, I don't mean to insult you, I just want to remind you. When you see something repeated in the Word, you know it's something that the Spirit wants you to pay attention to. It's something you need to take hold of. You need to sit up and pay attention. And so we see three times. Habakkuk isn't mentioned, but the phrase, the verse is. We find it in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul is writing to the Roman church. He says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, he writes, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. And then the Hebrew pastor in chapter 10, and there are some people that would say that the Hebrew pastor was Paul, and there are some people that would be wrong. <laughs> Anyhow, in verse 38... This is what the Hebrew pastor says. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So what we see right here in the midst of everything that Habakkuk is going through. We as God's people receive the answer to how can we as his people live in frustrated times. Because you do understand 
you're going to be frustrated. I don't care if you raised your hand or not earlier. If you haven't been frustrated through all this mess, I don't think you're alive. We are going to be frustrated, especially if you're a Christian. How can I speak that so confidently? Because as a Christian, I'll remind you, we are not of this world. We are in the world, but not of it. We are light unto a darkened world. We contrast. We are salt that brings out the God seasonings, the God flavors of the world. We are of a different kingdom. There's no other way around it. And this is a kingdom, and let me just say this, because there's a lot of nonsense that goes on in church, and I think it's all right to say it, and if it's not, I'm going to say it anyhow. I am proud to be an American. I want you to understand that there's there's this big movement in church and in our church of the Nazarene that it's almost sinful to be patriotic. Well, that's just stupid. I'm thankful that I was blessed to be born in the United States of America. I I am. I'm thankful for the servicemen and women that have fought to give me the right to stand here behind a pulpit without fear uh, and anything's going to happen. I'm thankful for that. And if you don't like it, move somewhere else. Uh, That's just how I feel. You know, I, I am... American, but as a Christian, my loyalty is first in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God conflicts with the kingdom of the world. In fact, you've probably heard it said before that God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom. We need to reshape our thinking because God's kingdom is right side up. Everything else is upside down. But anyhow, we say that because... We live in a world that tells you to be first. But Jesus, the king of our kingdom, says that if you want to be first, then you've got to be last. The world tells us to be somebody, step on whomever we must in order to be that person. But Jesus says if you really want to be somebody, then you've got to be willing to be nobody. You've got to become the servant to all. See, that's so counter to what culture tells us. I promise you that. Go to work tomorrow. Go to school. I don't know if you're in school or not, but, but go wherever you go and look at the motivational posters on the wall. You won't find any that say, be last. That's not the world we live in. But this is the kingdom that we are part of. We are living for the kingdom. We are longing for what will be. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm just going to help you a little bit. If his kingdom's going to come here on earth, you've got to allow his will in your life first. Well, I'm preaching good and some of you aren't even getting into it. (laughs) We live for what will be. Think think with me just a minute. I don't want to get caught up on this, but But we are living for a day when there won't be any need for doctors or hospitals. My mom went through a health scare this past year, and and I'm thankful for good doctors and good hospitals. I I, I really am. But there will be a day when they won't be needed. We're living for, for a day when there won't be a need, and won't this be a wonderful day? No need for first responders. I mean, you can't seem to turn on the television anymore without seeing some foolishness that somebody's caught up in. And I'm just going to say this, since I made friends before, I might as well just keep it up. I am thankful for our men and women in uniform, first responders, police and firemen. Men and women who will run toward danger when we're running from it. And if you don't like the police, if you don't like the firemen, don't call them. Or move somewhere where you're outside of their protection. Defund them in your own place. That's all I can say. But we're living for a day when there won't be a need for any of that. We're living for a day when there'll be no more goodbyes. I live my life saying goodbye. I have for 24 years. I go to places and I meet good people. Not all y'all are good, but most of you are. 
Come on, you know I'm telling the truth. A, a, a group this size, there's one or two bad apples. And if that makes you mad, you're the one. I, I mean, I meet good people and I'll be with them for a few days, have a good meal with them, all that sort of thing. But then I say goodbye and I leave and I may never see you again. You know, and, and beyond that, I grew up watching my papa preach all my family funerals. I watched him preach his siblings' funerals. I watched him preach his grandchildren's funeral. I mean, all the funerals. And I always wondered what. But somehow now that's fallen onto me. And not too long ago, I preached the funeral of a double cousin of mine. Do you all have, you all, do you have double? Are we too west in Kentucky for you to know? about? I'm from southeast Kentucky, and, and we have double cousins down there. But I'll tell you how we got It's nothing weird. I don't think I need to explain it. I'd say that in some places, and they'd look at me. Now we know why you're not so smart. But anyhow, um, you get a double cousin. My, um, my dad's mom's sister, my mamaw's sister, married my mom's dad's brother. And because of that, it's nothing weird. Just don't try to figure out. I promise you that. But I'm tired of it. But you know, on this side of the river, we'll have those goodbyes. But over there, it'll be an everlasting hello. On this side of the river, we'll have broken hearts. But when we get over there, those hearts will be mended. And we are living for the day when there's no more goodbyes. Where justice will reign and love will be all. But we're here. There is no escaping the fact that we are here in this fallen world. So we will be frustrated. So how do we as God's people live in these frustrated times? And the answer thunders through scripture, through his spirit. We live by faith. But the problem is, now I'm going to get very real with you. I learned a long time ago, I can't be anything but who I am. Some people don't like it, that's all right, but in my life, I want to say in your life too, but I don't know you, so I won't. But in my life, there's a natural tension between faith and doubt. It almost seems natural. It plays out in our lives. That struggle's often there. We want to believe, and I need to make sure you understand this about me. I have a high view of Scripture. Meaning, I believe every word in the book is true. I do. I believe that there was an actual garden, I talked about it this morning, that God planted and a man that he fashioned from the ground that made a decision that altered mankind for the, for, for, for the rest. I, I believe that actually happened. I actually believe that there was a man named Jonah that spent some time in the belly of a big fish. I don't think it's just a nice story that gives us morals. I believe that there was a man named Noah that built a big ark. And, and if you don't believe that, it's basically in my backyard. I'll take you up to Williamstown, Kentucky. 40 minutes from my home, I'll show you where the ark is now. It's interesting, it has water damage. But anyhow, I believe the word of God is true, but I'm also obsessive compulsive. I was diagnosed when I was around seven years old or so, and so I pick things apart. I'm analytical. I get on my own nerves, so I know I get on yours. It's okay. All that kind of thing. And there are times in my life that what's going on up here interferes with what's in here. I know God's word is true. I believe every jot and tittle. I believe every promise he spoke will be. But then, just like Habakkuk or countless others, I look around and things don't measure up. So we see that problem we want to believe but what we see is contradicting what we know. We see the injustice. We see the pain. We see the brokenness of our world and the wars that are raging all over. And it's hard for us to reconcile. And yet God says the just, the righteous shall live by faith. So tonight we have to try to at least define what faith is. 
Or maybe, better said, where the foundation of faith needs to be laid. I, I really begin to question, what is faith when I wrestled with Habakkuk? Habakkuk? Because when you ask a question like that, what is faith? I look around at you and most of us, many of us, have grown up in church. So we've got the Sunday school answers. But here, I, I'll just be honest, I'm not satisfied with the Sunday school answer. I don't want something that's just recited. I want to see what, what faith is when I'm walking the streets of Cincinnati, Ohio. I want to understand what faith is when I'm sitting in, in, in an operating waiting room when my mother is going through a 13-hour surgery and I don't know if she's going to make it or not. I need to know what faith is. So what is faith? Now, it's been defined. I've, I, I've fallen in love, I don't know if you're like this or not, with the dictionary. Does anybody like the dictionary? I, I, I do because I find that, that words actually mean something. And so when we speak, we're actually saying something. And if we're going to speak, we ought to know what it is that we're saying. So if I run across a word that I'm not familiar with, I fall back on my training. Now, I don't have a hard copy dictionary anymore. I have a dictionary app because I'm with it. <laughs> and, and so it's always with me. And if you were to put in faith, you'll get a big long list of definitions. But the one that applies to us in our context would be faith defined is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. And because we're Christian, we know that someone is God. So it would be better said that faith for the believer is complete trust or confidence in God. But what is that? What does that look like? Now, Corey Ten Boom, there have been people all through the ages that have helped us try to grab a hold of little things that help us to understand faith. You remember Corey Ten Boom? Incredible uh, Christian woman. Uh, more than I will ever be, of course not a woman, but you, you know what I'm saying, um, went through the concentration camps. She had, when I was in high school, they uh, got a little bookmark that had an acrostic. Is that where it takes the letter of the word and little thing? And she said that faith is a fantastic adventure in trusting him. And I want you to think about that. Faith, and, and remember, she's been through the concentration camp is a fantastic adventure in trusting him. And this is what I want to say. I want to say, Corey, your adventure doesn't seem too fantastic. And when I'm going through things in my life, I want to say, this doesn't seem fantastic. It hurts. So maybe you're satisfied with that. And I guess it is a good way to remember it's a fantastic adventure in trusting him. And then, of course, our, our foundation, our, our authority is the word of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, just one verse in between the verse I read to you earlier, 1038. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But I'm still wondering, what does that mean? I mean, if I'm going to live my life in a fallen world by faith, if I'm going to be able to stand solid in the midst of all the frustration that's going on, what is faith? What does it look like or where does it begin in my life, in our life? So I've been working on a, a definition, and I, I would say that it's a working definition. I'm going to share it with you, and some of you might not like it. If you don't like it, don't take it home with you. I'm just trying to help you as I'm helping myself. I believe that faith for the believer is believing what we read in God's Word before or until we see it happening in our world. And I'm going to say that again because I can tell some of you are thinking about it. Faith for the child of God is believing what we read in God's word. Before or until. And notice, I'm not saying if. Before or until we see it happening 
in our world. So if you wonder where the foundation of faith lies, it's in what God has said. There are a lot of people that want to go around saying, I'm going to speak these words of faith. Well, I don't care what you say. I want to know what he has said. Because if it's simply a man saying it, it may happen, it may not. But when God speaks it, you can mark it down, it will be. So the believer must know and believe what God has said. If we are going to live a lifestyle of faith, there's no other way. You have to be in the book. And yet, in 2020, in a day where we have more conveniences than any other time, we like to say, well, we're just busier. Oh, baloney. Don't tell me you're busier than the man that was standing behind an ox pulling a plow. You have more options. And your priorities may be different. But we have more comforts, we have more ease, we have more tools to study the Word of God. We don't even need to know how to read. And I understand that there are those who don't. We can now have it read to us from our phone, from the radio, from whatever it may be. And yet we are some of the most biblically illiterate people there have ever been in history. We don't spend any time in God's Word. And then we wonder why we're flimsy in our faith. We don't know what He said. That's why we can stand up here and sing songs and lift our hands when it's not even biblical. I was speaking at a Christian university not too long ago. It wasn't Nazarene, but you do know there are other Christian universities besides just want you to know that but anyhow I, I, I was there and and the the chapel was full the praise team was up there singing and they stood up and began to sing this song popular song it's on the radio it's everywhere and I watched as everybody all of a sudden put their hands up and they weren't even singing something that was scriptural so I leaned over to the president of the university. I should learn not to say things like this. But, but I leaned over and I told him, I said, if I were the president of a Christian university, I wouldn't sing songs that were unchristian. I've never been invited back. <laughs> Hear me on this. You have to know what God has said. He has spoken. And then when you know what he said as his people, that's where we operate. Anything outside of that, there's not even a question. We operate in his word. Not if it will happen, but if he said it, believing that it will happen. Because faith for the believer, I'll say it one more time is believing what we read in God's Word before or until we see it happening in the world. And I, I, I can see some of you are skeptical. You're thinking, that's a pretty weak... Where would you come up with a definition like that? Well, let me tell you, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says this. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And there are others, if we wanted to take the time, that we could recite. But, but you don't need any more than that. It's right there. And then when you look at Christian history, because we're not the only ones that have walked this path. When you look back, you'll remember there was a guy named Martin Luther. And when you first come across him, he's a mess. I mean, he's a wacko. He, he really is. If you ever look at his life, he is out of his mind until he started to get in the Word of God on his own. And then he discovered that we are saved by grace through faith. But how did he come to that conclusion? By getting in God's Word. That was the foundation of the Reformation. That is why we are here tonight. Because we believe so strongly okay you're not impressed by that you taught me this in children's church i remember singing the songs you remember? jesus loves me this i know for the 
this isn't something new. Faith comes from knowing what God has said. And then in the Church of the Nazarene, in the holiness movement, we believe in a full salvation. We don't simply believe in initial sanctification or salvation, forgiveness of sins. We believe in an entire work. That God can purify man's heart. That he can cleanse us from that sin. And if you buy into that, John 17, 17 says this. Remember, Jesus is praying to the Father. He, he's praying for his disciples, the 12 there. He's praying for us here tonight. He says to his Father, sanctify them by your truth. We believe in entire sanctification. But he doesn't stop. Listen to what he says. He says, your word is truth. So don't stand up. And button your collar all the way up to your neck and say, I'm holy, if you can't read the word of God. Don't get up on your soapbox and say, well, I'm sanctified, I'm better than everybody, if you can't be. Don't even tell me you're saved if you won't spend any time in his word with him. Faith is believing what we read in God's word. And yet we treat it so. We don't even bring our Bibles to church. The just. During frustrated times. Shall live by. His so you do understand what the opposite of faith is tonight. We like to say doubt, but, but it's not. The opposite of faith is sight. Because doubt arises from what we see. When we've got our eyes on everything else, doubt arises from listening to or looking at the wrong things. And God has said the just shall live by faith. So this is what I've come to tell you. In the midst of all the mess that's going on in the world, in all the frustration that I'm sure you've been feeling just like I have, I want you to understand that faith is for frustrated times. Aren't you glad for that? Whatever you're experiencing, whatever you're living, whatever you're going through, you can make it. We were talking about Pastor Chalfant. Morris Chalfant was my pastor when I started going to the church of the Nazarene at the age of 15. I told you my papa pastored in Missionary Baptist Church. But at the age of 15, a girl asked me to go to the church of the Nazarene to a revival. And so I went not because I wanted to know anything about the church of the Nazarene. Not because I wanted to know anything about Jesus. I wanted to know a whole lot more about her. I thought if I went to church with her, I could sit by her and my knee might touch hers. That's a big deal for a 15-year-old boy. You, you know, all that kind of thing. But uh, I, I never got the girl. <laughs> it doesn't surprise you. <clears throat> but I got Jesus. And I gained a spiritual family in the Chalfants. And uh, Pastor Chalfant, he, he's an incredible man. I talked to him. He, he was one of those old timers. He did a little bit of everything. He was a missionary in Africa. He was an evangelist. He was a pastor. I mean, those old times, they used to do it all. You, you, not, not that I'm calling you an old timer. We were just talking about all these things, you know, all that kind of thing. And so I, I talked to him every week up to his passing. And so I'd call him and I'd complain because I'll just be real with no reason to hide it. I'm a complainer. I am. If you treat me wrong, I'm going to complain. I won't complain to you, but I'll make you famous everywhere else I go. <laughs> I'll see those people in Lancaster. I tell you what, holiness under the Lord, my foot. Let me tell you what they did to me. I mean, I'll spread your name around. Everybody will know about you. No, I'd call him up and I'd say, Pastor Chalfant, can you believe they made me sleep in a Sunday school room on a twin bed on the ground with a rodent running through all my stuff that I could hear of the nighttime and I had to take a shower across the church in the ladies room where the shower was and I had to be out by six in the morning because that's when people see I wish I were making that up I tell him and just once I wanted him to say you know what Billy you're right they, they, they shouldn't have treated you like you're right Billy 
But you know what he'd say to me every time I talked to him? He'd listen and he'd say, you're going to make it. I hated that. I did, but I called him. I must have not needed. He'd say, you're going to, and I know what he was saying. And I have come to say to you tonight that you can make it. No matter what your situation may be. How? By believing what you read in God's word. Before or until we see it happening in our world. And by the way, I'm finished, but you got to see this. Faith always leads to praise. Maybe that's why many of us don't freely worship. Because faith always leads to praise. The structure of this little book is interesting. It begins out, as I said, in chapter 1 with Habakkuk pointing his finger in God's face and saying, you need to straighten up. By the time you get around mid-chapter 2, especially to the end, now all of a sudden, this is what's being said. God is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And then in chapter 3, I mean, something has happened. Do you, you know what Habakkuk is doing? He's praying. But do you know how he's praying? He's singing his prayer. How do we know he's singing? Because he gives instructions to the instrumentalists. See, faith can sing despite your circumstance. It's amazing because understand this. Nothing changed. The circumstance was not removed. Babylon was still coming. In fact, they did come and scatter God's people everywhere. But because of that, we're here tonight. But what changed was inside of God's man. Because he realized what God had said will be. And so he rested in that. So let me ask you this tonight. It's kind of an odd way to close, but let, let me ask, how is your faith? Maybe I should change it just a little bit because you know where you're living in that. So maybe I should say, what's the source of your faith? Are you in God's word? You know, don't you? I mean, you can sit there and put on a happy face, but you know deep down how much time you spend with him. And more importantly, you know he knows. Are you in God's word daily? And I'm not talking about Max Lucado. I'm not talking about um, whoever that woman is. I, I, I'm not talking about that. In fact, there's nothing wrong with reading good books. I've got a few I'll sell you if it. I don't know why we settle for regurgitated things. When we can go to him, and if he'll speak to Joyce Meyer, that's her name, if he'll speak to Max Lucado, guess what? He who is no respecter of persons will speak to you as well. Are you in his word? Are you able, despite your circumstance, to be able to sing? So confident in who he is. Or are you like so many others that are focused on everything else around them that they're drowning and they don't even realize it? How's your faith? What's the source of your faith? Eliza Edmonds Hewitt wrote these words. My faith has found a resting place. Not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. Now listen to this. My heart is leaning on the word. The written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name. Salvation through his blood. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It's enough that Jesus died. And that he died for me. But how did she know my heart is leaning on the word? The written word. Where is your heart leaning tonight? If we're going to have revival, we've got to lean on what God has said.
So Jesus tonight, nothing's hidden from you. You know exactly where we are, exactly where we're living. You know our habits. You know what we allow to source our living day to day. And I pray tonight that you would give us, your people, a renewed hunger, a renewed enthusiasm for what you've said. We can pray for revival, we can, but until we come to the point that we so fall in love with your word, so fall in love with you, it will never happen. So help us in these closing moments to be real, as real as Habakkuk was. And could you do something in us like you did in him? I'm going to invite you, please, with your heads bowed to stand to your feet if you're able all over the sanctuary. I believe, I didn't say it this morning, I don't think, but I believe whenever the word of God is spoken, it demands a response. In fact, I'm so simple that I believe whenever the word of God is spoken, we do respond. Every one of us in this place will respond. And based upon that response, we'll be different. We'll either be closer to him when we leave or we'll be a little bit further away. The only option we don't have is being the same. Because we've spent a little over an hour together in this place, in his presence, under his word, we will never be the same again. I wonder tonight, do you need to talk to him? Do you need to spend some time with him concerning your faith? There are altars here. I'm not going to beg anyone to come. I just want to invite you. God wants to do something. There's no question in my mind. And if there was ever an hour when God could do something incredible, it's in an hour when the world is looking for the answer. But we as his people need to take care of what needs to be taken care of so we can be the light that he's called us to be. So how is your Bible time? How is your faith? If you want to spend some time with him as my brother plays and before Pastor Dwayne comes and leads us in a closing prayer, why don't you come? There's plenty of room.